Address by Yang Amat Bahagia, Tun Datuk Sri Zaki, Tun Azmi. Former Lord President of the Federal Court, Muhammad Azmi Muhammad. Upon being appointed Chief Justice, Tun Zaki was determined to restore the integrity of the judiciary and made it his mission to get rid of the enormous backlog of cases that was a major problem in our courts. And the moderator for this session will be Dina Azmi. Hope you enjoy the session. Your lunch is going to be delayed by 20 minutes. <laughs> I want to tell you a few uh, to wake you up a bit, you know. Uh, I want to read to you a few examples that I read in the Wikipedia. I always still refer to Wikipedia today, you know, even though I was... There are some laws like this. Eh? You read, read uh, there's, there's one provision in the, what is this, the Alabama law, I think. City council order reads, no dog shall be in a public place without its master on a leash. Did you get that? <laughs> no dog shall be in a public place without its master on a leash. The wording should mean that he should not be the dog. Sh sorry, there shall no be no dog without its master, unless the dog is on the leash. But these are exact, uh, you know, You are not permitted to wear cowboy boots unless you already own at least two cows. <laughs> it, is, <laughs> it is illegal to spit, except on a baseball baseball diamonds. You can speed when you're holding a baseball, not otherwise. <laughs> Women may not wear high heels while in the city limits. I do not know why, but... That... <laughs> okay, now that I have woken you up, let's go into the substance of my, 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 my paper. Uh, I don't know who formulated the questions for me, but uh, as you have posed to me the, the topic, where's the topic? Huh? <laughs> topic? The topic is rule of law, restoring faith in the judiciary. As you have posed to me the question on the topic of this lecture as to whether faith in the judiciary has been restored, I would like to in turn pose to you the question whether there was, in fact, any loss of faith in the judiciary that needed to be restored. I hope to answer the question in the course of this lecture. I must also, at the outside, outset, apologize to you if, during my lecture, I deviate from the main topic that has been given to me. Firstly, ladies and gentlemen, let us, you are entitled to be addressed as ladies and gentlemen, not just as students. <laughs> Firstly, let us understand what is the meaning of the rule of law. 
in school we learn that the rule of law i'm applying this to the law students you know i didn't realize that the students are a mix i thought they are, you are all law students but nevertheless in law school we learn the rule of law was attributed to dicey a 19th century english jurist before that there were also greek scholars who had their own understanding of the rule of law since dicey the definition of rule of law has given very varied meanings some wider than others the united nation has given a very strict definition of what the rule of law is to the layman however the rule of law means that the decision by the court must be made according to the law it cannot be at the whims and fancies of a judge deciding resulting from perhaps a direction instruction or request from another party or because by virtue of his own belief his race or religious inclination to think that the law should not be how it is worded but how he thinks it should be read students look up to judges who are daring enough to read into the law some things which students believe to be supporting the principles like human rights lord denning was looked up by students during my time because he had in many cases struck down subordinate legislations by the british government as students we always like to support the underdogs and anything which is against authority is always right but as you grow older you will change <laughs> is this correct in india and pakistan the respective courts have moved to the point of almost running the executive government this is because everything in those countries is so politicized and that's what i'm worried about malaysia as well every other policy of the government has been challenged a plan to build a road or a bridge somebody can challenge because he's not happy with the road or the bridge the project comes to a standstill while the case takes years to be argued in court at the end of the day the court has to decide whether the construction should go on or not once the court decides it becomes final because and only because there is no other forum or authority to appeal to according to one periodical that i read lately it even extends to the giving of licenses or the management of traffic in some instances these challenges are taken up for corrupt reasons in the sense that the so-called unsatisfied party could be prepared to withdraw his challenge if the respondent pays him something is this a rule of law mind you these decisions all relate to faith in the judiciary how can we have faith in the judiciary if the judiciary is too ready to upturn every decision of the executive there has been a lot of instances today of judges who try to take over executive function of running the country and who to try to take over the function of managing or administrating administering the country of or the locality as i've said many 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 times ago before who are the judges sitting in a panel of 3 5 or 9 to dictate against the representatives of the people elected through the democratic process of by a, of a few hundred in number who have already decided on those issues you would all have read in the media lately lately means the last few days about how the pakistan pakistani parliament has passed a law a contempt of court bill 2012 to prevent the court from taking contempt proceedings against the ministers and their pm in particular the government has decided not to commence action relating to alleged acts of corruption by the president to that it is an executive privilege who who are the courts to decide otherwise 
Once courts enter the arena of executive function, there will be an upheaval. An example is the Egyptian courts declaring part of the recent elections void because not, uh, candidates who were not eligible were allowed to participate. I do not know all the facts and it is difficult for me to comment on those decisions. I do not know all. <coughs> the latest news report seems to indicate that Morsi has agreed to abide by the Constitutional Court's decision. But imagine if one third of the elected members had to give up the seats, the whole election has to be reconvened, and or otherwise there will be another revolution. The Western world will be laughing when this happens. By the way, the cost that the country will incur to hold a general election is behemoth. I understand that the total cost holding a general election is in Malaysia is a few million ringgit. So, to what extent should the court play its part in so-called upholding the rule of law? The courts are resorted to by people unhappy or claiming to be unhappy with any decision of the government or public authority. These plaintiffs could be your neighbours or even your best friends. They will go to a lawyer who may be ever ready to find a cause of action suitable to make a claim. Never mind if he succeeds or not at all. Some cases are filed without any supporting evidence available. Previously, they knew these cases takes years to be finally decided. The respondents are held to ransom by frivolous suits, so they file their claims. The innocent suffer. Those who do so just put up a pressure, or those who want to deny the bona fide claim will drag on the case. Today, Malaysia, in Malaysia, sorry, today, Malaysian, and I repeat, Malaysian judges, play an important role in getting parties to have the cases heard, set down for early trial, and complete the trial early as well. I believe with cases moving faster in court, there should be an improvement in the faith of the judiciary. There would be more faith in the judiciary in the sense that the innocent party will get his right determined with much earlier. There will therefore be fewer parties abusing the process of the court. It is unlike previously when the pace at which the cases move depends on the parties themselves. Courts used to tend to agree to the wishes of the parties. Councils tended to give and take. Today, postponements are not casually given except only to very, very, very good grounds. Cases move faster. Ladies and gentlemen, there are many instances where some strong-headed judges purportedly uphold the rule of law when in fact they are upholding their own personal beliefs, as I said earlier. These personal beliefs could include their belief on what they consider to be, for example, human rights, or because they feel religiously or racially obligated to decide a case in a certain way. For example, a Christian judge may decide on the planning case in certain way because it involves the planning of a church. It equally applies to a Muslim judge who perhaps has to decide a case involving a mosque or a burial ground. In some instances, the influence by these beliefs are so strong that they sincerely and honestly are convinced that they are holding the rule of law. But are these judges truly Oh, upholding the rule of law? Would the public have faith in the judiciary in those circumstances? Ladies and gentlemen, speak, speaking about belief of the judge, there was an instance where a judge was so eager to uphold what he believed should be the law that he actually overlooked the wording of the legislation, intentionally or otherwise, to hold that the detained to detain a young offender at the pleasure of the king 
was ultra-virus, the principles of separation of powers, which the law students amongst you are aware forms part of the rule of law. He was persuaded by a Jamaican decision of the Privy Council. The Privy Council in that case held that because detaining a person is a judicial function, it is against the Jamaican constitution and the constitution upholds the separation of power to empower the king to decide or to empower the queen to decide on how long the young offender should be detained. In my opinion, the previous council in that Jamaican case was so influenced by the European Human Rights Convention. You must not forget that when England became a member of the European com community, it became a member of the EU Human Rights Convention. The same members who sit in the Judicial Committee of the House of Lords, now the Supreme Court, also sit in the Privy Council. Because of that, they could have carried with them the principles enunciated in the Human Rights Convention to their own decision. Fortunately, our federal court in that case of five members viewed it differently. The detention at the pleasure of the king is a practice and law that had been applied from time immemorial. It perhaps originated upon the principle that the king is also the head of the judiciary. In so saying, I'm also aware that the previous council case that held our Yanni Pratuan Agong acts on the advice of the cabinet and therefore is in effect an executive and not the king in its original sense. In my opinion, a law as old as this relating to detention of young offenders should not be changed by the court. It will cause havoc in regard to those who are presently being detained at the pleasure of the young Dipratan Agung or the sultans of the state. In my view, it would be against the rule of law to change it by judicial decision. As is the principle in the third limb of Dices, uh, of the definition of, law, of the, the definition of the rule of law, that is, the law should be definite. If the law, if such law is to be amended, it should be done by Parliament, and to make provisions in regard to those who are currently under detention. Ladies and gentlemen, in the United States, before a candidate is appointed to the Supreme Court, he has to go to two or three days of grilling by the Senate committee. I use the word grilling because it was, it, 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 that was what it was. I was in Washington DC when one candidate was being interviewed by the Senate. From what I read and heard over the media, it was obviously a very torturous affair. I expressed my view to the Chief Justice of the United States, who I met during that visit, that I would rather not go take the job of a judge of the Supreme Court if that is what I have to go through. Candidates are questioned into every detail of their life, personal and official. They do this purportedly to ensure his independence, that he is not biased on any issue. Yet, yet, when it comes to politics, we all know that Al Gore lost to Bush in the Supreme Court uh, during the election in the Supreme Court over the voting in Florida, which was critical in determining the successful candidate. And it was merely by a few votes. That few, the vote in the Supreme Court, that one vote would determine the success of Bush in the Supreme Court came from a judge appointed by the president of the same party as Bush. So, even in a nation which was supposed to be most transparent and objective, politics play an important role. Where is the rule of law in this instance? Malaysia is a very difficult country to administer. I faced problems when I was a Chief Justice and I totally appreciate and sympathize with the burden placed upon my successor. The only consolation I had 
was that my administration decision, administrative decisions are to some extent made easier with the formation of the Judicial Appointments Commission. This commission consists of five judges and four eminent persons. It helped in arriving at my administrative decisions. The difficulties that I refer to relate to the pop population of Malaysia, which comprises of people of different communities, races, religions, belief, and culture. The judiciary at all levels, magistrates, sessions judges, high court judges, court of appeal judges, federal court judges, must comprise of people from different communities. At the appeal court, the federal court, the panel itself should again consist of people of different communities as far as possible. And this is not easy to do. I face the difficulty of getting enough Chinese candidates to become judges. We have no problem about getting those from the Indian community because majority of the in Indian, uh, sorry, majority of the litigation lawyers are Indian. There are also enough Malays from the government service. But then we need good commercial judges from the private sector. I'm however happy to say in this respect, I managed, managed to partially restore, if anything needs to be restored, the faith in the judiciary by having appointed the most number of non-Malay judges from the private sector during my tenure. Most of these judges were assigned to handle commercial cases. Ladies and gentlemen, I've spoken to you about bias shown by interference in the executive function of the government and bias due to personal belief of the judge. There is another category of bias and this one is the most detestful. This is this is those cases where decision has been arrived have arrived at in, and influenced by consideration whether in form of money, award, or promotion. A judge who would decide a case based on what he gets or expect to get or to be rewarded must be totally ostracized by the committee. It is easy to, date to say that these judges of this type should be removed, but removing a judge in Malaysia is a difficult process. You need sufficient strong evidence to do so. In my opinion, any judge who even smells of being overly friendly with the certain people connected with any case should be excluded from hearing the case at the very least. If he feels he cannot be impartial, he should recuse himself. When I was a Chief Justice, I received flying letters regarding the impartiality of one or two judicial officers. When that happened, there seemed to be an end, there seemed to be grounds, and informal investigation is normally conducted. If there's any basis, action is taken immediately to move that judge to another division. The only consolation that I, I had was those cases form a very small number. You may also have heard about two judges, high court judges, who were requested to put in their premature letters of retirement. But I can assure you, these two judges are asked to go not because of dishonesty, but because they were lagging behind in their work. Ladies and gentlemen, on the subject of corrupt judges, whether currently or previ previously, my predecessor, Tun Hamid, and in many instances, has said that behind every suspected corrupt judge, you will find a corrupt lawyer. Word spread among the business communities that in order to succeed before a certain corrupt judge, you should engage a certain particular lawyer. Yet, people who scream most about corrupt judges are the lawyers themselves. Yeah, what? Siapa yang bising sekali? The lawyers lah. The Bar Council is against corrupt judges. But it is their own members who encourage corruption amongst the judges. 
prior to employment as a judge, there used to be talks among lawyers that there were one or two judges who were highly sus suspected to be closely associated with some lawyers to the extent that if a certain lawyer will appear to appear before a certain judge, the decision of the court is predictable. I'm happy to say that these judges retired before I became the Chief Justice. I would like to think today there are no more such judges of such characteristics in our Malaysian judiciary. I would therefore assume that the public is quite confident in the faith of the judiciary has been restored. Ladies and gentlemen, upholding the law, a rule of law, is important to every citizen. What is the use of upholding the rule of law if it takes years to do so? In India again, so I read on the internet, Wikipedia, it takes three to four hundred years to complete their cases at the present rate of disposal. Three to four hundred years. In many other Commonwealth countries, in Africa and certain countries in Asia, there are still a lot of pending cases waiting to be heard. Just like Malaysia many a few years ago. These cases would take 5, 10 or even 15 years to dispose of the cases. Persons charged for serious offences are incarcerated awaiting trial. Plaintiffs who failed filed their case had to wait for years for the cases to be heard. Defendants suffer anguish and anxiety not knowing when their fate will be determined. In the meantime, lawyers get richer because every time a case is postponed, he collects some fees from his clients. In running down cases, accident cases, I hear there were lawyers who would advance loan to their clients while waiting for the case to be heard. And by the time the court makes a decision, a big chunk of the amount awarded will go to pay the lawyers the loan plus interest. In Malaysia today, that is different. Running down cases are disposed of within six to nine months. I therefore say with pride, not for myself, but for the Malaysian judiciary and the judicial officers, that I can stand up anywhere, anytime, to say that cases filed in Malaysia move faster than in any part of the Commonwealth. I stand before Lord Phillips in England. I told him that. I told him that the same thing to Justice French, the Chief Justice of Australia, George Ma, uh, Jeffrey Ma in Hong Kong, that, the, what's his name, the Singapore Chief Justice. Everywhere I stand, I say that. In India, New Delhi, Mumbai. Another thing we are proud that all the improvements was done in less than three years. Read the World Bank report. It's not by me, you read the World Bank report. While improvements continue to be made in the first three years, changes continue to be made today by my successors. Even the World Bank recognized the improvements and more so the speed at which they were achieved. Even the Attorney General recently considered a few nights ago that courts are moving so fast that his DPPs are collapsing in the courts. <laughs> the cases are moving so fast, the PP, DPPs can't take it, they collapse while prosecuting. My response to them is that his DPPs are not used to working hard. That's why previously courts used to sit only half a day, now they sit a full day. Some say, where is justice if cases move too fast? The courts were accused of justice harried, justice buried. I, on the other say, on the other hand, say, justice should be used to be 
buried so deeply that one needs a backhoe to dig it up. Of course, that was said in jest. The fact remains that the public and lawyers are happy at the rate of disposal today. Otherwise, I can assure you, lawyers would have paraded in front of the Palace of Justice with their placards condemning the judiciary. There were attempts to do this when the courts first became very strict about granting of postponements. But it died down because the public supported the court action. The public, of course, are the lawyer's clients. If their clients are happy with the speedy disposal of cases, who are the lawyers to complain? As a result of the rapid disposal, 95% of the cases today are current. Whatever cases are considered to be backlogs are those that have gone up on appeal and have repeated to the court of first instance. Cases at the Magistrates' Court, Sessions' Court, High Courts and the Appellate's Court are almost all current. There are still a few backlog of cases at the Court of Appeal, but I hear the, president of, the current President Court of Appeal is getting the Court of Appeal judges to clear them. I understand cases at this court should be current within the next one or two years. Ladies and gentlemen, by the way, the side benefit of the clearance of cases and less payment granted to, to the parties is that the government saves money. It previously needed witness, in previously, witnesses and parties have to come to court repeatedly before a case is heard, and in so doing, have to incur a lot of expenses. Today, they do not have to. The number of cases is reduced because there are less cases. This is a saving for the government. The saving could be able to be used toward rewards to the officers in some way or another. In the year 2011 alone, the government saved 29.4 million because of the reduction of the courts as well as the staff. Speaking about disposal of cases, one method which the courts have introduced is mediation. Honest and sincere parties can have always their cases adjudicated in a friendlier manner. Some of you, particularly those who have a hand in drafting topic of architecture, I'm sure is rather disappointed that I have totally deflected from the subject you expected me to speak on. So let's hear the real answer to that topic you have posed to me. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, there was the perception that the courts were acting under the directive of the executive. This was a big issue with the removal of one Lord President and a few Supreme Court judges. Then came the issue of removal of senior judges, that the judges were bowing to the wishes and the demands of the executive. I cannot say, and I have no evidence to support or otherwise to dispel the perception that our judiciary was behaving like that then. There had been many writings regarding the removal of those judges. Tun Mahathir in his book, Doctor in the House, has given his side of the story. There was also a book written on the same subject, as well a very comprehensive report by the Bar Council. There do not seem to be any explanation or justification given by the judges themselves, the judges who were removed, as to what actually happened. At least, I do not know if there is any. The closest and the most direct evidence was from Tun Mahathir in his book, where he explains that the removal of the then Lord President was at the request of the young Diplotuan Agong, resulting from a letter written to by that Lord President, which created the displeasure of the then young Diplotuan Agong. The removal of the other judges was for different reasons, i.e., that they had not acted in a manner that the judges should, 
and was acting in subordination of the then Lord President. Nevertheless, these judges were subsequently compensated with large sums of money, or so I heard. Again, I have no evidence except for what I read in the media. Why they were compensated much later, I also do not know. I can only assume that the compensation was for their wrongful dismissal. As I said earlier, by coincidence, the media also raised the subject recently. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to ponder and arrive at your own conclusion on the perception or allegation that even today, and I'm talking about the Malaysian judiciary, is at the back and call of the executive. Recently, the leader of the opposition, who I assume is the biggest political enemy of the Prime Minister and the government in power, was acquitted by a relatively junior judge and one who would be looking for a rapid promotion. If it is possible to influence the judge to arrive at the conclusion to convict that person with a promise of a rapid promotion, I'm sure he would have done. But this is not so. Secondly, you may also remember the same person, this leader of opposition, was acquitted by a panel of judges at the federal court. This federal court panel was led by a judge who was subsequently appointed as the Chief Justice. Thirdly, the judge who declared Amno illegal in 1987, and I was the lawyer acting for Amno at that time, was soon after declaring Amno illegal promoted to be a judge of the Supreme Court. And there, there were also another case recently where I presided the federal court and awarded a judgment of 11 million ringgit against Felda. And Felda, as you know, is the organization which is chaired by the Prime Minister. So, I leave it to you to conclude whether the judges in Malaysia are independent to arrive at their own decision. The winning party in any case is always happy to say the judge was impartial, but the losing party has a lot to gripe and accuse the judge of bias or corrupt. Anyway, over 1,000 cases are filed in Kuala Lumpur alone daily. If they don't have confidence in the judiciary, why do they do this? And you hear complaints in regard to perhaps one or two cases. Now, again, next, what I'm going to refer is going to address to the law students. Law students, go and read the House of Lords decision in Pinochet. Was there a likelihood of bias when one of the judges was a committee member of the international, international committee member of the international MNST, MNST International? Or was the decision of the House of Lords in Pinochet made in that way because of the special, friendly, diplomatic relationship between Britain and Chile? Compare that case with a few more English cases on bias. Udin it was one of them. One of them was Udin. You will then arrive at your own conclusion whether even in England, even in the House of Lords, whether the judges were biased. When I was in practice, there were claims that foreign parties would insist that the seat of arbitration was to be outside Malaysia because of the poor image 
and the perception against the Malaysian judiciary. Those lawyers against judiciary would continue to file thousands of cases in court. But today, today, many of parties to international agreements would want the uh, seat of arbitration to be in Malaysia. There's another issue which I'm sure you have been reading in the blog. This is that the Perak government was won not in the election but in the courts. And in this instance that the accusations have been thrown at the government and the judiciary that Perak was won by the government in power through court process and not by democratic means. I was the Chief Justice then. I can assure you I did not interfere or even was responsible for constituting the panel to decide the case. Yet accusations have been thrown at me. I ask all of you who has any doubt as to the transparency or independence of the decision to read through the grounds of judgment, particularly one by the Court of Appeal, and arrive at your own conclusion. You are lawyers or soon to be. Read those cases and then you decide. I can shout until my throat is dry but the party concerned, or more so the bloggers, will continue to make the same accusation. As regards independence of judiciary, if you remember two days or three days ago, our current Chief Justice, Tun Arifin, was awarded the highest governor, uh, he, was highest, uh, he was given the highest award in the governor's birthday list and Penang is under the opposition government. Why should Penang, under the opposition government, give award this to our Chief Justice if they do not think that our judiciary is independent? I leave you to decide that. Now, as I come to the end of the talk, let me recapitulate what I promised when I took the highest judicial office. When I was appointed the Chief Justice, I was interviewed by the Chairman of Bernama. He asked me what were objectives that I had. My answer was, one, I needed to clear the backlog of pending cases, and two, to improve the image of the judiciary. As far as I'm concerned, the backlog is, uh, as far as the backlog is concerned, it can be proven by statistics that the backlog has been cleared and cases are moving than faster before. The issue of image is more difficult to prove. But from the response that I read in the media and all the cases I gave you just now, I think there is nothing to complain about the integrity of the Malaysian judiciary. I can only assume that the public are satisfied with it. When I refer to the media, and I, I mean the blogs, there are not very much complaints now. So, I leave this lecture. Students, ladies and gentlemen, and students who I respect and most admire, as I was also at one time a student, with very high ideals, as many of you here today. When you are young, you have a lot of ideas, which you will later find to be not so practical. So what is the answer to the question posed by the topic of this lecture? I was the Chief Justice, and of course, I'm very happy to say that the image has been restored to be good. But it's up to you to decide. As a judge, I've tried to support my conclusion by giving you all the authorities and cases. But you, 
at the end of the day, will have to make your own conclusion and decide whether the faith in the Malaysian judiciary has been restored. With that, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. An A session now. We'll, because we are running out of time, I will make way for three questions from the floor. Starting in the Bar Council, um, the Legal Profession Act 1976 uh, stipulates that the Bar Council functions to uphold the cause of social justice and represent the voices of the lawyers in Malaysia. Um, and for that to happen, the Bar Council has to be uh, non-partisan. However, lately the government has suggested that um, it is no longer impartial and is suggested replacing it with the Law Academy. So my question to you is, um, do you think that the Bar Council is still non-partisan and relevant? And uh, how do you view the government's stance on this matter? Thank you. Thank you. Firstly, I, think, I don't think the government meant to me, which will cover uh, 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 people with a law qualification from any, any, every, everywhere, from the academics, or even if you're a non-practicing lawyer, you can become a member of the Law Academy. Now, the question of whether the Bar Council is political, I regret to say so, that is my personal view too. My personal view is that the Bar Council has been infiltrated by so many politicians that every time it makes a statement, and I said this too, 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 uh, President Lim Chi Wee, openly, publicly, that uh, you are being too political. In order for people to respect you, for the public to respect you have to be very objective. Uh, but since then, Lim Chi Wee, Mr. Lim Chi Wee has been, has changed his stance slightly. But uh, I also feel sorry for Mr. Lim Chi Wee because he has to say what his member wants him to say. If counsel wants him to say that the law is bad, he has to make that statement. So, <laughs> I, to answer your question, yes, I agree that the bar council tend to be, uh, tend to be rather political uh, when it should not be. And uh, yes, uh, that's my answer. Thank you. We think that your work in um, trying to improve the integrity of the image of the Malaysian judiciary is highly commendable and uh, in the way that you guys have tried to include more uh, judges of all the different races in Malaysia on the, uh, on, the, on the panels. But I think one of the greater reasons that we lost faith in the judiciary was not due to efficiency or a lack of uh, racial diversity. It was... Um, more due to, the, uh, to uh, the question of the impartiality of some of the judges. And I realized that you would try to address this in your speech. You uh, talked about judges. They cannot be over-friendly with any pol political party. And you addressed this when you spoke to Russell just now. And um, I realized that you, you said that you cannot speak on behalf of those who were um, uh, removed from their posts because they were tied to a political party, but that, um, I'd like you to at least be able to speak for yourself. In this book, um, the MSLS, the note, uh, booklet here, mm. it says here that you were both the Chief Justice as well as the legal advisor to UMNO. Mm. So on that note, I'd like you to justify how this is not being over-friendly. Madam, do you know if I sat on any Amno case? <laughs> I had to clap myself because nobody wants to support me. <laughs> I didn't hear any case. And I said just now, I didn't hear and I didn't influence. Whether you believe me or not is another matter. Because I'm only to say, you can interview all the judges at the federal court, at all levels at the court. You can ask them. I can only say that, as I said just now, I can shout until my throat is dry. Whether you believe me or not is another matter. And I tried to justify by analysis, analytical giving the cases. The cases where uh, if I am the UMNO and I want to fight the government, of course I will tell my judges, 
put this man in jail. Isn't it? He is the biggest oppo opposi opposition to the uh, the Amno president. I would tell the judge, put him in jail. Have I done that? The other argument that I hear and you see in the blogs is this. Oh, they control at the court of appeal, they control at the federal court. And you should read the interview, my interview with Nat Graf. I said, there is a judge at the first instance, the most junior and inexperienced. There are three judges at the federal court, more experienced, consisting of three. And the three judges or five judges at the federal court, more experienced, consisting of five. If I want to influence, the most junior is the most easiest to influence. But when you come to the Federal Court of Appeal, there are three. You have to influence three persons. And when you go to the Federal Court, you have to influence any more, some more, three, three more. You arrive at your own conclusion. Whether you want to accept the decision of the most junior in, uh, inexperienced judge, or you would rather accept the decision of three, or three more, or altogether six, or eight, whatever it is, of more experienced judges. You decide. I'm not, I'm not asking to decide. I don't want to decide, because I do not know myself. I can shout and scream, I didn't do, I didn't do, I didn't do. <laughs> From the applause. From the applause that I heard supporting your question, it means you don't believe me. I can't do anything. Only God, I always say, only God knows what my decision is. That's fine, that is okay. And I tell you this, I tell you this, I tell you this, you, read, you will read in one of the papers. Uh, um, soon there will be something. In it. When I was supposed to be appointed as a judge, Listen, miss, listen, look, look here. Look here, miss, look here. When I was asked by the then Tun uh, Abdullah Badawi to become a judge, the first reason I told him, don't appoint me. Why? I am I'm not a advisor. I sit on the disciplinary. I'm a practicing. I'm a, I do business, a bit of business, business. Don't appoint me. But he says, I can't find anybody whom I can trust to change the judiciary. So I had to. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, for the non-Muslim, Alhamdulillah. Thank God, thank God. God was behind me to help change the judiciary. <laughs> image-wise, image-wise, I bet you as I leave this room, those who are against me will still not be convinced with what I want to explain. It's up to you. My conscience is clear. I'm a Muslim, my conscience is clear. Because, you know why I'm stressing this? When I look at the face of the lady questioning me, she's not convinced. Pirah, stemberang, dia cerita saja. Betul tak? You're not convinced. So I cannot convince. Only God, when you die, then God will tell you whether I was honest. Yes, next one. Creative RM uh, um, 2.2 billion contract uh. to build the Kinrara Damansara Expressway. How will you answer to that? Is your wife expert in building highways? Thank you. There's a whole problem. All these are political. I thought. First question I ask you, do you know who the shareholders of the company is? <laughs> do you know who the shareholders of the company is? First question, I'm not going to answer. Secondly, who wrote the blog? Malaysia Insider. Huh? Malaysia Insider. No, where did Malaysia Insider got the report? <laughs> it's in Wikipedia. Huh? I 
don't want to answer you lah. Sorry, gentlemen. You don't know your facts. You don't know your facts. Don't make allegations. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. We have one, um, thank you. We have time for one more question. The gentleman in in the middle. Hello. To recap from um, from the previous few questions and and to take I mean stand away from the subjectivity that we've been trying to reassert and reassert again. That I mean it's all at the end of the day up to ourselves to whether believe you or not. Um, I'd like to ask a final question on a more personal level to yourself as as a person and I mean having been through. Um, your previous past few decades of, of life in, in law and in the rule of law in Malaysia. Did you regret um, taking upon both the roles of, of being the, the legal um, advisor to UMNO and at the same time take, take upon the role of being the Chief Justice? And um, Because at the end of the day, the reason why there have been such um, unsupported accusations um, that are you know, not backed with a lot of sources upon you is because of, you know, what, 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 what is seen um, on the surface to a lot of people. You know, people can see very easily that you take upon two roles that seem quite contradictory, but to yourself, you might have a lot of, you know, reasons to justify that. Did you then, on a personal level, regret taking upon such, I mean, controversial position uh, per se? Okay. My con I think I've changed the image of the judiciary to be respected, not only in Malaysia, but internationally. That's one. <laughs> Secondly, have you heard the name Justice Arif Yusuf? Do you know he was a candidate for PAS? Do you know that? You do not know. He was a candidate for PAS. He stood for PAS. He lost the election. He's now a judge. <laughs> Why don't you go and complain? You do not know. No. Okay. The other person, Mustafa, Justice Mustafa. He was in Gerakan. At that time, Gerakan was in the opposition. He was a candidate for Gerakan. He was a practicing lawyer. He became a judge. You do not know. <laughs> yes. Okay, can, I, can, I, can I ask a very last question? Um, so as the Chief Justice, as the leader of this all bunch of judges, who has all held this, just as similarly controversial positions as you, um, I mean, being appointed as the judge, but still have affiliations with different parties, and as the Chief Judge, and taking upon the role and manifesto to really you know, revolutionize the image of, of the whole judiciary. What do you think um, is the step moving forward? Or, or what have you think you could have, I mean, done more if, if you are continuing uh, as a position to, to, to change this fact? I mean, what, what, are the, what are the measures that we can place upon to, you know, for once and for all, say that if you are appointed a judge, any sort of affiliations with any parties will then not be tolerated from this point onwards. So that, I mean, the people's um, image towards all these complaints that you've mentioned can change once and for all. I mean, it's not about I the individual. I do not know. Honestly, I cannot answer you that question. The government has already, as I said, appointed people from the opposition government, uh, opposition parties. Not only I was an advisor, full stop. I'm just ordinary member. I did not hold any position in the AMNO. Just like you all, you one day will become advisor to a political party. But do you, is your mind, a big, are you a politician? You are not. I wasn't a politician. I became a member and member where I know. But to Buru. Because one day I was doing cases for Amno, somebody says, are you a member? No, I'm not a member. How can you be act for Amno without being a member? Nah, one ringgit, I pay. That's all. And in Amno, once you pay one ringgit, you become for life. You don't have to pay your... your <laughs> yes, it's, it's a fact. It's a fact. So, and I know, I, I never intend, I have no ambition, and yet compared to another who stood for election on the ticket, past ticket, and yet he's still a judge. Who is more biased, me or him? Do you think? You decide. 
Of course, I was there on top of that. Now, satu lagi ya. Even if you go and read the English cases, Lord Denning, I read one judgment election case. I can't remember the name of the case. No. I read through the judgment. I say, how can Lord Judgment, Lord, Lord Denning, arrive at this conclusion? Later on, I discovered Lord Denning was a conservative, and the party in power was a conservative. No wonder, lah. I said he can arrive at that conclusion. Again, that is my perception. Rightly or wrongly, I do not know. You go to US. I told you just now, all the judges and the Supreme Court were selected on party basis. You don't believe me? You go and read yourself. Don't. You are all lawyers. Don't rely on what Zaki say. He's talking rubbish. He's lying to you. Go and read for yourself. Nine judges. You see, it depends, you know, because um, the, 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 the judge is supposed to be um, appointed by the president, current president. Whenever there's a vacancy, the current president will appoint. And of course, he will appoint people who's, who, are, who may not be in the party, but is sympathetic. I said to you just now, if the government, the courts, are going to keep on hitting, and passing, uh, making decision, upset, upsetting the, the whole election process. The country will come to a havoc. I don't have the statistics with me. I couldn't. You see, pro, I honest, honestly, what happened was when I met the uh, Dina last Saturday and a few members, I said, I've not prepared my speech yet, you know. <laughs> so I had one whole week to prepare. But given a bit more time, I can produce cases during the last election and elections before that where the government cases brought by the government in power in the election petitions there's so many cases where the government also lost you know i don't have the authorities with me lah but even time i have to do the research because i was acting for i'm not we lost a lot of cases ago before judges that is a fact but you all don't want to believe it's up to you lah that's why I don't want to answer the question. I leave you to decide. Thank you so much, Chief Justice. Huh? Thank you so much. No. <laughs> any, any more questions? Let's go on. Skip the lunch. <laughs> this is interesting. This is interesting. Really matter if I, believe, uh, if I believe you or not. I believe you on what you mentioned just now. But the question is, uh, just now you mentioned that there were two judges who have uh, ran for a position first. Then only they became a judge, right? So, uh, if you thought that it was bias, why didn't you fire the, those judges? No, I didn't say that. I didn't say they're biased. What I'm trying to say is, when a person is appointed a judge, it doesn't matter where he comes from. One is Arif, he's now in Kuala Lumpur. He's a judge in Kuala Lumpur. He stood for election as a past candidate. Nevertheless, he was still appointed a judge. But because, as some judge said to me, and I believe, once you put that rope, the judge's rope, your mind becomes very, very impartial. And for me, for me, I can say this. Once I put on that rope, I don't see the Chinese or the Indian or the Malay or the community. You put on the rope, your mind becomes some or other. Just like a doctor. Are, are there any medicine doc doctors here? Doctors, you don't have any doctors. There is a doctor. When you treat a patient, when you treat a patient, you don't look at him whether he's Indian, Chinese, Malay, whatever it is. You look at him as a patient. You know, you may not like Indians. But when the or Chinese or whatever language or whatever it is, no, 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 sorry, sorry. I mean, it's not. You may not like a person of a certain. Please, 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 please. Sorry, I beg your pardon. I withdraw. You may not like a Malay. You may not like me, doctor. You may not like me. But when I come before you for treatment, you don't look at me as Zaki. You treat me as your patient, and that is why. And same with the lawyers. 
when a client walks into your office, you look at him as a person. You don't look at him with his Indian, Chinese money, Iban, or whatever it is. And that is what a judge. As I said to you, today is 2012. 20 years to, from today, you reflect what I say to you. And you will know that what I say is correct. Today, is I was also like you, you know. My mind is all like that, you know. <laughs> Seriously. And then as you grow older, you become more matured. You went through life. And then you become uh, more objective with your views. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, we have to end our session now because uh, lunch no, is until... Like so, no, oh. <laughs> Just one more question. Okay, one, last Just one, last one. Last. Okay, uh, Tun Zaki, I, I would first like to address, it is undeniable of the contribution you have done towards the justice, the judiciary system and everything. Well, well, I, did, I, did, I missed that. I... <laughs> I want to thank you for what oh, you have done you. for the judiciary. No, no, I seriously didn't hear. Not, not yeah, that okay. I want. Yeah, I'll proceed with not it. Not that <laughs> I wanted more, more applause from you. You know, seriously. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Um, not Your having question. any prejudice or biasness. Firstly, you were talking about sometimes Is when biasness or bias. Bias. Sorry. I'm. <laughs> okay. Not talking about bias or prejudice. Sometimes you see judges who have affiliation with some of the involved parties. There is a common practice in the UK whereby the, federal, the Supreme Court or the House of Lords will put a practice statement whereby any judges found to have any sort of affiliation, no matter however small, they have to... Um, Recuse themselves. Them. Yes. Is it a possibility that Malaysian judges are to be subject to such uh, practice statement? Is it uh, in the foreseeable future? No, no. It is there. It's there. It is there. There is a, uh, if you read through our judges' conduct, code of conduct, there is a judges' code of conduct in Malaysia. Okay. In fact, the code of conduct goes beyond that, you know. You should not be mixing too much. Even you go to the... Decide whether or not... a a judge should be recused because usually we depend on the integrity of the judge yeah. to conduct At the themselves. end of the day, you have to depend. If I know a friend of mine sitting there and I want to help him, why should I tell my other judges? Right? <laughs> so, it's your own integrity. If the other judges come to know about it, of course, the president of the panel will say, you recuse because you are related to that person. Or if this party objects, then he can recuse. But if I want to help, who are you to tell me? It's a fact of life. Um, Tunzaki. Yes. I would like to just put a point. Actually, the um, role of the judiciary is to keep the executive and the legislature in check. Yes. If the, let, the judiciary itself cannot keep themselves in check, who are we to put this um, responsibility on the judiciary to keep the whole legislative and the legislature and also our... No, wait, 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 wait a minute, Mr. Wait a minute, Mr. Are you still saying that the Malaysian judiciary is dishonest? No, no, no. I'm that, trying to say that if any instances with, would indicate that the particular judge has any, has any kind of affiliation, they should uh, recuse themselves in any instance. Of course. I totally agree with you there. I totally agree but with you there. But no one is there to enforce that. How do you do it? I told you just now. If you are sitting as a judge and you know your friend there appearing, you keep quiet, your friend keep quiet, who is to know how you decide? Should we not produce a way in order to counter such... Can you suggest a way? How do I read your mind that you know the person? The only way is you go on appeal. The judge who's biased at the first instance, if he cannot reason out properly, when he goes to the court of appeal, 
that ground by the judge will be attacked. That is the only way. How else do you do? I do not know. Um, if uh, evidence is produced yeah. before the court itself, would uh, of course, the external of course, judge come in? I said just now in my true. paper. In my paper. Even if we have suspicion of a judge, magistrate, session judge, or high court is friendly with a certain party, we move him out. Who move him out? The Chief Justice. So the Chief Transfer. The transfer. For example, huh? difficult. This is very sensitive. Anyway, <laughs> they're very sensitive, uh, you know. Are you trying to say the one, uh, the judge? Who no, 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 not those two. This is, this is another person. No, I'm, I'm going to give you a fictitious name and a fictitious place. To stop okay. you there, Thank um, you. gentlemen. Okay, your moderator say no more, no more. I cannot do anything. I'm Sorry. ready to fight you. Uh, I'm ready to go on another one hour. That means your lunch period is cut short, you know. I'm ready. I'm, I had my heavy breakfast this morning. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, I, I, I honestly enjoyed meeting you all. Honestly, out of my heart. Doesn't matter what you think of me. Doesn't matter you believe me or not. I don't care. My conscience is clear. I've tried to explain to you, only God knows. It's up to you to decide. One of these days when you become a judge, some of you will become judges to the federal court, maybe even a chief justice at that time, then you will reflect back today to what I say today, and then you make your own decision. So thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi To the MC now. Ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, welcome UKC's chairman, Mr. Shawal Hafiz, to give a token of appreciation to the speaker. Thank you very much. This is another custom, you know, of the Malaysian. Eh? Everywhere I go, I collect this thing. My cupboard is all full of this. Uh, <laughs> But never mind, nevertheless, I will remember you with this. Thank you very much. <laughs>